Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is good to see you on this Sunday morning. Uh, this is fall break, and so some of our folks are off fall breaking it. And uh, we pray for them that they will have a great time as they enjoy their time away. I know John T. and his family are camping this week, but it is good to see you here this morning. It is good to see those who are on Facebook Live, and we want to welcome those who are headed uh, this way, as we always do. Uh, let me just mention a couple of things. First of all, we need to be praying for Lib Baker. Uh, she is in the hospital, and uh, so be praying for her if you would. She is battling um, an infection, a pretty serious infection, so just be uh, lifting her up to the Lord. Continue to pray for D Debbie B. Uh, we are lifting her up uh, in prayer. She is still in the hospital as well. Margie Kindiger, if you would pray for her. Uh, she texted me a little bit earlier. She's going back to bed. Um, she has taken some medicine. So pray that God would be with Margie. Uh, Barry Reeves is not feeling well this morning, so be praying for Barry. And then also uh, Myra Dunn is in Red Bank Life Care in room 116. So if you would pray uh, for Myra and John. We also want to pray for the nation of Israel and what's going on uh, started yesterday there. Uh, for those of you who have been with me uh, on some of those trips, uh, I have uh, touched base with our friends uh, there and um, the ones that I can get a hold of, they are safe uh, as of right now. So just pray that God uh, would be with them, that God would be with Israel, that God would be with our country and this world. As you know, this is a very serious thing, um, unprecedented, well, you know, for the last 50 years anyway. Uh, and so we need to really pray for them. Um, I would encourage you to truly search the Word of God. Um, we are watching uh, things happen that, um, I mean, it, it's just really... Um, you could just sort of lay the Bible down and, and watch as things are coming together. And, and I would encourage you to begin reading the book of Joshua and other passages and just, um, just pray, if you will, for the nation um, of Israel. Very quickly before we pray, next July, that's a long time off, but next July uh, we are planning a trip to the Apache Indian Reservation. Uh, there is a sign-up in the Welcome Center, or at the Welcome Center, in the Daryl and Dean Newman Fellowship Hall. If you are interested in an information meeting, uh, please go in there and put your name down. We'd love to take 10 or 12 folks with us. We've already got seven, I think, uh, signed up. We can take more than that. Um, but if you're interested, uh, please sign up um, right after this service to the Apache Indian Reservation uh, should be an exciting, exciting mission trip. Um, don't forget about our fall festival coming up on the 21st. It's going to be an incredible fall festival. I need pumpkins. I need pumpkins, guys. I need pumpkins. Um, we want 150 pumpkins, and so far I have 20 that have been donated. Uh, and so if you can donate some pumpkins... This is what I want you to do. Right now, if you can donate some pumpkins, I want you to take your phone out and text me <laughs> how many pumpkins you can donate, all right? No, I'm kidding. But, but please, please, if you can help with uh, pumpkin donations, we have a pumpkin patch and we ran out last year. So, so please help us with that. Secondly, and then we'll pray, uh, I am looking for folks that will help in the bereavement committee. If you love to cook and you have a servant heart, please let me know uh, that you would be willing to help on that committee. When one of our church family members, when they pass away, um, we gather and provide a meal for them. And, and so we need help in that um, time of preparation. Cindy, All right, if you would leap to your feet right now, just leap to your feet. We're going to pray. Uh, don't forget about third. Uh, Throwback Thursday in a couple of weeks where we gather to sing hymns and eat Jason's Deli that we delivered. All right? That's 
on the 26th, and the sign-up is also in the fellowship hall. Let's pray together. Our Father God, in the name of Jesus, we bow before you. And Father, we thank you so much, as we often do, that we can be right here, right now. Several of our church family stand in need of, of sweet intercession this morning. So God, I pray that you would be with uh, each of their hearts, Lord Jesus. Several that are just not feeling well, God, or they have other things that they're dealing with, distractions, Father, and serious issues. God, we do pray right now. Father, we pray uh, for our friends in Israel. Dear God, I pray for your hedge of protection to be on them. Everyone in that region, everyone in that area, Father. Father, I pray that you would be with these other names that we have mentioned, Lord God, today. Father, bless our church family members who are away this morning and enjoying a fall break away. I pray that you would give them a great time of relaxation. And God, for us who are here today, I pray that, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth and... Father, that we would get a hold of the Word of God and that it would challenge our lives so that when we walk out of this church house, our lives would be different. You are our God and there is no other. Bless this time. And all God's people said, Amen. If you guys knew what went on this morning before this service, we've had to change all the songs. Um, but that tells me that God is moving in White Oak because when things like that go wrong, Satan is messing where God is blessing. We're going to have an awesome service despite any distractions or things that are going on in our lives. Let's give it all to him this morning with blessed assurance. This is my story. This is my song. This is 
your neighbor how many pumpkins are you bringing to the fall festival and say I'll bring one
All right, if you could make your way back to your pews and have a seat, we're going to continue worship with Doug Hudson singing Long Black Train.
with Because He Lives. Sweet 
sing it is well with my soul and I don't know about you guys if you have a soul that's unsettled this morning but I need this song personally
seated. So Nate and Abby are going to sing a song for us this morning called God is in this story. And our guitarist, Tyler and Andrew, learned it this morning. <laughs> kind of. um, and it sounds great. And I know it's going to be a blessing this morning. There's torn up pages in this book, words that tell me I'm no good, chapters that define me for so long. But the hands of grace and endless love dusted off and picked me up, told my heart that hope is never gone. God's people said? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Nate and Abby, for that beautiful song. As our kids go back to Kids on the Rock, let me say thank you, praise team. Uh, as they said, they had to sort of um, change everything around this morning, and uh, thank God for a sweet time of worship today. Take your Bible and turn to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. And I want to preach a message this morning. Titled Legacy. Legacy. As you know, we are in a three-week series 
um, on John chapter 9. We began last week looking at the story uh, of this blind man. And this has to be an incredible miracle uh, because it takes up a lot of real estate in this gospel. 41 verses are dedicated to uh, the healing and to the aftermath of uh, this healing. And so when you look at this passage of Scripture, uh, so many things come to light that we have seen and that we're going to see. If you remember last week, Jesus was walking out of the temple and he passed by this man who was born blind. And the Bible says that his eyes locked on to that man. And the disciples began to ask him some questions about why he was born blind. Jesus was answering those questions and then he did something that to us would seem very unusual. He spit on the ground and he made mud pies and he rubbed that blind man's eyes with the mud pies and he told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he washed and he came back seeing. That's what the Bible says. And so... This morning, we're going to look at what happens right after that. But as I was looking at this, I began to think about legacy. And I want you to be listening very carefully this morning to, to this thought and this question. What do you want to be known for? We're only here for a short amount of time compared to eternity. And so what do you want to be known for? Uh, do you want to be known as that lady who is generous with her compliments or generous with her time? Do you want to be known as that uh, man, that gentleman that was generous with his resources? Do you want to be known as that gripey person? When, when you're no longer here, do you want to be known as that gripey, get off my lawn kind of guy? That negative individual? Do you want to be known as someone who is grateful? Last Sunday, right after I preached, I was standing right here and I was uh, shaking hands with folks. Jennifer Nichols, I love her. She's one of my favorite human beings on the planet. I'm just going to go ahead and say it right there. As she rolled right down here, I call her testimony on wheels, all right? I've taken her all over the island of Jamaica, and she has shared her testimony, and, and folks have come to Christ and been encouraged. She rolled right down here, and she told me right here, it was right here, she told me right there, she said, you know what, that chapter means so much to my heart, the healing of this blind man. She, go, she, went, she continued to talk, and she said, you know what I'm going to do? When I first get to heaven, do you know what I'm going to do? The very first thing, and I was listening, and she said, I'm going to get on my knees and bow before King Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And then she said, you know what the second thing is I'm going to do? She said, I'm going to take off running. Amen. I love that. I'm going to take off running. I told her she's going to run the bases. That's what she's going to do. She's going to hear. We won't see her for 10,000 years. I'm telling you. Her and Ronnie... They have a foot race scheduled for when they both get to glory, and my money is on Jennifer. It's on Jennifer. <laughs> if I was a betting man, but I'm all right. But I listen, do you want to be known as someone who is grateful, someone who is godly, someone who, when we pass from this life, this short amount of time, man, he, he loved King Jesus. He was involved. He served. She was involved. Listen, do you want to be known like that? What, what, is, your, mm, mm, what is your legacy? John chapter 9. I want to read just a couple of verses. we got a lot of text here, and we're just going to sort of work through it. Uh, this morning, verse by verse. But I just want to read a couple of verses here, um, several to, to kick us off on this thought of legacy. John 9, allow your eyes to fall on verse 13, and notice what the Bible says. They brought him who was formerly blind to the Pharisees. And now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees 
also asked him again how he, can, how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. And therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. There was a division among them them. Let's pray together. Our Father God, in the name of Jesus, we bow before you, and I thank you so much for your word that is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, today, as we look at this text and as we look at our lives, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. And Father, all the way throughout this, I pray that we will ask ourselves the question, what do we want to be known for? And Father, when we get to the very end, that we'll again ask that question. And Father, I pray, God, today I pray that, that you would speak to every heart beginning with my heart. And Lord, I pray right now that you would draw a circle around this preacher and let the fire of heaven fall. For it's in Jesus' precious, powerful name we pray. Amen. There are two things that I want you to notice in this passage of Scripture um, this morning, first of all, we're going to notice the critics. We're going to notice the critics. And when you look at our text, when you look at verse 13, I want you to notice exactly what it says. Verse 13 says that they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. They, who in the world, who, who are they? When you look at that passage, it's obvious that it's talking about their, the, the neighbors and it's talking about the friends, those folks who knew him, uh, they were in his village or they had grown up with him. They knew him when he was blind. And so those folks, they bring him, they take him to the Pharisees. And so who in the world are these Pharisees? Josephus, the great historian, tells us that there are about 6,000 of them uh, in that area. And they are religious leaders that unfortunately added tradition to the laws of God. They added man-made rules to the laws of God. They were holier than thou. They were hypocrites. They were religious sticks in the mud. Jesus said that they would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. They were an interesting group of people. Now, what was so amazing about them, sadly, is everything they did, they wanted to do in front of people. They wanted to parade in front of people. When they gave, they gave to be seen by men. When they fasted, they fasted so everyone would look at them and go, oh, they must be fasting. That's why Jesus, and this is a paraphrase, Jesus said, listen, if you're going to fast, Brush your hair and wash your face. That's what he said. In other words, don't, don't do it just to be seen by men. If you do that, that is your reward. And the Bible says when they prayed, these Pharisees, they prayed just to be seen by men. They, they went to a busy street corner and, and they began to pray. And, and they prayed in those stained glass vocal cords. You ever heard that? Oh, God. You ever heard that? That's how they prayed, so that everybody could look and say, oh man, they're great prayers. Jesus had some interesting things to say about these Pharisees. He really did. In Matthew 23 and verse 16, he called them blind guides. Woe to you, blind guides. In verse 17 of this same chapter, he called them fools. Look at this, fools. Can you imagine that, fools? In verse 23, he called them hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. In verse 27, he called them white-washed tombs. Look at what the Bible says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like white-washed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, 
But inside, Pharisees, you are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. And then in verse 33, I love this, you bunch of snakes. He looked at them and said, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes in the grass, you serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? When I read Matthew 23, I ask myself, Jesus, tell us what you really think about the Pharisees, amen? Oh my goodness. He tells sentence after sentence what he feels about the Pharisees. And so why in the world, back to our text in verse 13, why does it say the friends and neighbors, they brought him, they marched him to the Pharisees. Why did they do that? Well, I believe that, that they, were lo- they were looking for a theological explanation of what happened. Later in this text, this man himself, he said, listen, nobody from the foundation of the world has ever been healed from blindness. And so they're sitting there, they're scratching their head, and they're going, what in the world's going on? So I believe that it's not malicious, but they're taking him to these religious rulers and going, what in the world is happening? So they take him, the Bible says, to this man who was formerly blind. They take him to the Pharisees, and then verse 14 says this, now it was a Sabbath. I want you to look at your neighbor and go, uh-oh. Look at your neighbor and go, uh-oh. Now look at the other neighbor, your second choice, and do it like Scooby-Doo and go, rut row Do it like, okay, all right. You rut rode better than you uh owed You really did. You rut rode better than you uh owed Listen, the Sabbath. We did not hear that it was the Sabbath until the 14th verse. And it says here, John says, now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Oh, my soul. It was like alarm bells were going off. It was like for us Wednesday at 2.20 when our phones went nuts this week. (laughs) Ding, 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 ding. It was like alarm bells were going off. This is the Sabbath. You know, I said that the Pharisees made additions to the laws of God. You're supposed to honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. You're you're not supposed to to work. You're supposed to worship God. But they had added all kinds of things. You could not walk more than 3,000 feet on the Sabbath. You could not light a candle. You could not blow a candle out. You could not put oil in in a lamp. You could not extinguish a lamp. Get this one. If a mirror was hanging on a wall, you could not look at it. Silliness. If you had a toothache, you could not get that tooth pulled because that was work, but you could suck on vinegar. I don't even know what that means. But that's what you could do. There were all of these, all of these rules And one was this, you could prevent someone from dying, but you could not make them better. So Jesus, oh my soul. Jesus made mud pies. That's work. That's like kneading bread. That that was work, and that was an uh uh-oh, and you cannot do that. And then he put the mud pies on this guy's eyes, and he could see, so he made him better. And it was the Sabbath. I'm telling you, it's a big deal. When I was in Israel many, 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 many years ago, I was in downtown Jerusalem. I got on an elevator and there were two Jewish men behind me. And I got on the elevator, and the elevator doors did not shut. And if you know me, I'm pretty impatient, really, sort of. I'm always in a hurry. I'm always walking fast. And so they just, they just wouldn't shut. And so I'm punching the, the thing. I'm ready to go sixth floor. I'm punching the thing. And it just it wouldn't shut. And I keep on punching, and I heard them back there, and they were saying things, and I did not know what they were saying. They were speaking in Hebrew. And, and so finally it shut. And then it opened up on the first floor. And I thought, oh, my soul. 
And so I start punching the button again. And I do that all the way to the sixth floor. And they're grumbling and complaining. And, and, and it just takes its time to open, takes its time to close. And finally, when I got out on the sixth floor, I heard the only two words that I understood the whole time. They said, dumb American. That's exactly what they said as I walked out. I thought, what in the world? Rude. And so I asked my guide. I explained exactly what was going on. It was my first trip there. And he said, you got on a Shabbat elevator. You got on an elevator. It is work to push a button. So they set it up where it opens on each floor. And so you were doing work, and you were breaking the Sabbath. They're serious about this stuff. They were there then and, and now. But I want you to say, Jesus said something that's remarkable. Jesus said something in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. Look, he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Look at verse 28. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. That's what Jesus said. That's why they wanted to stone him. And then in John 5, look at verse 16 and following. For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. Because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. That's what's going on. So here, back to our text. In verse 14, the Bible says it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the mud pies and opened his eyes. Now, what I want to do is go to verse 15, and let me just sort of walk through this very quickly this morning. Look at what the Bible says in verse 15. Then the Pharisees also ask him again. In other words, they're circling back. They're really ready to grill him. They're going straight to the horse's mouth. They're asking this blind man, who was blind, how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. I love this dude. As I said last week, there was no fluff. He had an economy of words. He had the gift of being succinct. And look, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. I went because I sent. And now I can see. Because I obey. And so notice what takes place here in verse 16 of our text. Therefore some... Uh, the Pharisees said, this man, notice the derision there. They didn't even want to say the name Jesus. This man, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others, in other words, others of the Pharisees said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. When you look at that, these Pharisees are coming together. And, and the first part of the Pharisees said, Hey, listen, this man, he can't be from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. The other group says, Hello, we got a problem. This blind man is staring at us. <laughs> Something's happened, right? So, I mean, something's happened. This blind man is staring at us. And the Bible says that there was a division. In John chapter 7, in verse 43, it says this. So there was a division among the people because of him. That's several chapters earlier. A chapter later, in chapter 10, and, and verse 19, it says, Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And so, right one after another, Jesus is causing a division. 
And here in our text, he's causing one even between the Pharisees. In verse 17, I love this, of our text. They said to the blind man, again, what do you say about him? They're trying to punch holes in his story. They come to him again. What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he is what? He's a prophet. Church, that's, a, that's the same thing that the Samaritan lady said in John chapter 4 and verse 19, I think it is. John 4 and verse 19. The woman, that Samaritan woman, said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. You're a prophet. And so here, this man who was blind is now can see that the greatest thing that he can think of is, is this guy's got to be, he's got to be a prophet. He's got to be a prophet. And so, so that's what he says. He, he's a prophet. Verse 18, But the Jews did not believe concerning him. In other words, don't confuse me with the facts, right? That's what they're saying. Don't confuse me with the facts. They didn't believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. Look at verse 19. And they asked them, they asked the parents saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? In other words, have you been faking it all this time? You say. You say he was born blind. And can I just tell you right now, these parents, we're going to read it. They put this son out on the limb and they saw the limb off. That's what they do. We would say it like this, they threw him under the bus. They threw him under the camel. That's what they did. They stiff-armed him. I promise you, these parents would not win an award for Parents of the Year. I promise you that. Look at this. This is amazing. By the way, this is the first time this man has seen his mom and dad. Think about that. And what, the, what, what, what does he see? Look at, look at what... what mm. Let me get my glasses on. Look. Verse 19. And they asked them, mom and dad, parents of the year, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son. Well, that's good. And that he was born blind. Give them, give them that. Verse 21. They should have stopped at verse 20. Verse 21, but by what means he now sees? Hey, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes? We do not know. They don't know a lot. Look at this. He is of age. In other words, he's a grown man. Notice, ask him emphatic. He emphatic will speak for himself. Let that boy take care of himself. Why? Why? Because, verse 22, because the parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. And so they did not want to be put out of the synagogue. For social reasons, for financial reasons, for religious implications, they, they didn't want to be thrown out on their head. And so they really, they don't stand up. For their own son, they just look. And can you imagine looking at your mom and dad and them going, ask him. Ask him. He's a grown man. He can answer for himself. Mm. And look at what the Bible says here. Look at what the Word of God says. In verse 23, Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So they again, here they come again, they called the man who was blind, and they said to him, Give glory, give credit to God. Give God the glory. Give God the credit. 
In other words, praise God, not this sinner. We know that this man is a sinner. He's an imposter. Verse 25. He answered, I love this, he answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Amen. Amen. I know one thing, I was blind as a bat, and now I have 20-20 vision. I don't know anything else. But I was blind, and now I see. Brother T, are you saved? I don't know a lot. Thank you for not saying amen. <laughs> but there's one thing I do know. I was lost, but then I was found. I was blind, but now I can see. Try to talk me out of that. Try to talk me out of the fact that, that I'm saved, that I've been blood-bought, that I've been covered by the grace of Jesus. Try to talk me out of the fact that I'm on my way to glory. This man, he just said, this man said, hey, listen, I don't know everything. I don't know, what, I don't know any of this, but one thing I know, I was blind, but now I can see. I got that bright light. Can you imagine? I got that bright light in they're turning it on him. I love this guy. Verse 26, then they said to him again, <laughs> what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Verse 27, he's filling his oats. Do you know what that means? He's filling his oats. He's, he's got no fear. Verse 27, he answered and said, I told you already. And you did not listen. Look at this. Do you think he's grinning? Why? Do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> Look at your neighbor and go, burn. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do, do you also, hey, do you also want to be his disciples? I love this guy. He didn't buckle. Look, look at what it says here. In verse 28, then they reviled him. In other words, they cursed him. They unloaded on him and said, you are his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is even from. This man, in these next three verses, proves that he had a better grasp on the truth unconverted at this time than many people do converted. He goes from a beggar to Billy Graham. Look at what he does here. It's amazing. In verse 30, this man answered and said to them, Why? This is a marvelous thing. It's strange. It's curious. That you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, by Psalm 66, 18. But anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. And here's that thing I mentioned earlier. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Huh? Huh? That's what he said. Verse 34. They answered and said to him, You are completely born in sin. And you are teaching us. You're schooling us. And they cast him out. They cast him out. I don't have time for the second point. Because I preach so much on the first point. And I want to ask you a question. What do you want to be known for? Honestly, think about it. What do you want your legacy to be? I've thought a lot about that. Of late, for some reason. 
What do you want your legacy to be? Do you want your legacy honestly to be like a Pharisee? Don't confuse me with the facts. Just, just tradition and, and just made up stuff. Nowhere near the grace of God. Do you want your legacy to be like these parents? Man, they were, they were fearful. Sort of cowardice. What do you want your legacy to be? We're building it every day. You know that, don't you? We're building it every day. Every December, we have a memorial service. Every December. Every December. The last Sunday. And I stand right here. And I read off the names of our church family who were with us that year. But now they're in glory. I read their name, the date of their birth, and the date of their death. And then we hear a, a, a bell. Dwing. And then I read another name. And then I read another name. And then another name. Many of them have been right here. And I've stood right there. We're all going to die. Welcome to White Oak. <laughs> Welcome to White Oak. We're all going to die. If Jesus tarries, I'll be right here. And we all will be. I've done 140 or so. What do you want? Hey, 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 hey. What do you want your legacy to be? I know what I want mine to be. That man loved Jesus with all of his heart, with all of his soul. He loved his family. He loved his friends. He loved the gospel. He was plugged in. And numerous other things. I want it to be like this guy right here. He did not buckle. He stood his ground. When I pastored in another city, another town, we outgrew the building we were in. And um, the building we were in would seat about 200 people. We outgrew it, and we began to make plans for a 700-seat auditorium. And um, we were going to build, along with that, an office suite, and a big fellowship hall, put an elevator in it, and then classrooms. It was, uh, I think it was a $3 million project. And I never will forget my meeting, the very first meeting I had with the leadership, and we talked about it, and we went around the room, and it was so positive. It really was positive. There was one guy that was negative. He was so negative. I mean, every, everybody else pretty much was in unison. Everybody else was in unison. And this one guy, oh my goodness, he just was not. And, and we dug the hole. We, we voted. We dug the hole. And he didn't like the hole. We started building the foundation, and, and he didn't like the foundation. He didn't like anything. As it 
came out of the ground, and it was in that area. It was out in the middle of a cornfield, and it was beautiful, and it was gigantic for that area. He started calling it Tony's Palace. That's what he started calling it. Because he knew that it would, it would hurt my heart every time he said it. He started calling it Tony's Palace. God built that thing. I never will forget that first Sunday. We had over 700 people there. It was incredible. Before we even opened the building, we had a family join like three weeks prior to that, and they said, we noticed you don't have any landscaping. I said, I know, we ran out of money. <laughs> and they said, guess what we do? We're landscapers. Hallelujah! <laughs> they put thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of landscaping. It was absolutely beautiful. Story after story after story after story. We got in that thing, packed it out the first Sunday. Monday morning, I was in my office and my study Monday morning, and one of my secretaries, administrative assistant, she buzzed into my office and she said, so-and-so wants to see you. Well, I knew who so-and-so was. So so-and-so came to my door. And I said, come in. And he walked in, and he had family visiting from out of town. I'll never forget this as long as I live. He looked at me. I was sitting behind my desk. He looked at me. He said, Brother T. I said, yes. He said, is it all right right now if I walk my cousins, my family, around this big, beautiful campus because of what we did together? I want to show them. What we did. I said, sure, man. Have a great time. He's so proud he walked out there to go show them what he was involved in and how he, you say, Brother T, what was his name? This was 20-something years ago. I don't remember. I promise you. I don't have a clue. I, I do not remember his name. I remember his actions, but I don't remember his name. He was the get off my lawn guy. Now I remember the names of a lot of people up there that gave. I could tell you story after story after story. Because they were day by day building their legacy. What do you want to be known for? What do you want your legacy to be? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. We're going to have a time this morning of decision. No one's looking around on this fall break Sunday. Some of you may be watching by home right now, and I just want you to ask yourself that question. What do I want to be known for? Do I want to be known as a generous individual, as a godly man, as a, as a church person that got involved, that served King Jesus? What do I want to be known for? Maybe right now you're heading in one direction, but I'm telling you, you can change on a dime. I've seen it done before. Change the way you respond and the way you react. What do you want to be known for? This morning, if you're here and you have never given your heart to Christ, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, this would be a great day to walk down this aisle and put your hand in mine and just say, Pastor, I, I need Jesus as my Savior. I, I want to be known as a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe that's your day today. Maybe you've been saved, but you've never been baptized to show it. 
Maybe today you want to come and, and you say, next time you baptize, I want you to baptize me. And as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, maybe you're there and, and God has gotten a hold of your heart and, and today is the day you want to join this church family. You want to place your life here. We would love to have you to come and just put your life here. Say today, I want to continue my legacy and I want to continue and be a part of this family here at White Oak Baptist Church. Or maybe today you want to come and just get on bended knee and get a hold of a holy God. What do you want to be known for, church? What are you known for right now? Maybe you want to come and just spend some quiet time with God. I also want to open this altar up for those of you who want to come and pray for Israel and our nation and our world. Very quietly, very reverently, would you stand? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just stand. I'm going to pray. Right after I pray, I'm asking you to come. Come and receive Christ today. Come for prayer today. Come and join this church today. Come and say, I want to be baptized today. Or just fill this altar here with prayers for our nation and for Israel. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, I bow. And I pray, Father, I pray that you would move in a mighty way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. To hear you say that I'm your friend, you are my desire. No one else will do. Cause nothing else can take your place. Feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you. God has spoken. You come right now. You're all I want. You're all I ever needed. You're all I ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are here. Look at you come right now. Come on. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. Never let me go. I lay it all down again. Lay it all down again. To hear you say that you're my friend. To hear you say that I'm your friend. Sing it, church. You are my desire. No one else will do Cause nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to
encourage you not to walk out of this church house. If there is a decision you know you need to make. If there is a decision you know you need to make, make it today. Father, thank you for your love and for your grace. And I pray that you would continue to move in our midst. Father, Sunday after Sunday, would you just continue to move in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just stand right there. I'm going to ask if David and Lisa would come and stand right here beside me. Right here beside me. This precious couple, I've known them for some time, and they've been, they've been visiting our church uh, for quite a while. And this morning, <laughs> this morning they're going to come, and they're going to unite with us. And I praise God for that. I love this couple so, so, so very much. They are coming from a sister church, and so uh, we're thankful for that. They've both been saved, and they've both been baptized to show up. They're wanting to unite um, with this church family. And uh, this is my Waffle House guy right here. He's, a, he's an executive with Waffle House. And so, uh, amen. <laughs> I knew I'd get some amens there. And so when I'm not at the other place, I'm at Waffle House. Yeah, we're not going to mention that. No. <laughs> I love this couple. It is my prayer, I tell you, it's my prayer that I would be the pastor to you that I ought to be, that I would study and that I would preach without fear or favor, that you would be the couple that you ought to be. I already see your faithfulness and your love, and I thank God for that. Your love for the church and your love for King Jesus shines. And that you would be the family that you ought to be. Amen? Amen. And I know that you will. We're going to pray. And then, is it okay if they come by and shake your hand and hug your neck? Welcome them to White Oak Baptist Church. God is moving in a mighty, mighty way. Let's bow together. Jennifer, hand Anthony that uh, mic, and I'm going to have Anthony close us in prayer today. Or somebody hand a mic. Um, Right now, we are the church gathered. In a moment, we're going to be the church scattered. As we're scattered, let's shine for Jesus. Right after he says amen, come by and welcome this precious couple. And God, I pray that you'll continue to bless this church even outside of these four walls. And Lord, I pray that you'll be glorified in everything that your body does and that Jesus will get the praise. Lord, we want to close also, Lord, be with Israel. Be with those, Lord, whose lives are on the line for peace. And we pray for our brothers and sisters there, Lord, that you would put your hand of protection on them. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 